Hello and welcome in to Maroon and Bold. I'm your host and sports editor, Austin Chastain, alongside in the Zoom call with staff reporter Christian Boer. Christian, how are things going? We're about, what, halfway through the semester at this point. Uh, everything, uh, everything going well in your camp? Yes, sir. You know, we're doing all right, doing the best we can. Uh, at times, it feels like these uh, the walls within my dorm room are starting to kind of close in on me. Uh, with uh, You know, because you really can't do anything with the ongoing pandemic. And uh, so sometimes it feels like it's a little, little, you know, know, we got some good news here in the last couple of weeks and it's keeping us busy and can't ask for anything better than that. You got, you got that right, man. Um, Yeah. You know, it's an absolute grind, but we're, we're used to it. Right. Um, But yeah, like, like Christian said, lots of, lots of CMU news um, within the last couple of weeks. Uh, Obviously it, well documented, uh, brand new athletic director Amy Folan taking over. Um, well, we're we're recording this on Sunday, so she'll be taking over, I guess, tomorrow. Take taking over on Monday, October fifth, um, officially. Um, coming over from Texas, where she was um, pretty much, she was in charge of their um, their fundraising uh, arm, I guess, if if you will, um, the Longhorn Foundation. Christian, I mean, obviously, Fulham's going to bring a lot of uh, fundraising experience to CMU, but maybe thinking outside of that, what what do you think she's gonna she's gonna bring to the athletic program? Well, you know, she's coming from Texas, which is one of the best athletic departments in this con- or you know in this country at the col- at the collegiate level, and so she's got a, a ton of experience working under some of the uh, the better ADs, you know, that, that college football and college athletics as a whole have seen. And so she's going to have, you know, really quality experience. Like, she you know, she mentioned in her, her press conference, she learned from the best and now it's her turn. It's kind of like when, you know, you get this big name offensive coordinator that coaches under, you know, like a Bill Belichick, you know, gosh, it's kind of funny you say that. And then you start thinking about the Lions and Matt Patricia, you know, the big name coaches. But I don't expect this to be anywhere near that. Um, just, you know, she's got good experience. She's got quality experience. And the fundraising, especially when she's taken over for one of the better fundraisers at the at the mid-major level, and Michael Alford, and look at what he was able to do for this department with the, the new Champion Center, which looks awesome, and the, the new scoreboard, which looks awesome. And, you know, she's going to step right into that, and she's – you know, she's got the fundraising chops to, to do what he did and more, and I'm excited to see what she's going to do with this department. Yeah, absolutely. And and for the sake of the athletic department, I pray to God that she doesn't turn on like Matt Patricia has for the Lions. <laughs> <laughs> Man, um, you know, just a – wow. That, that's, that's a that's – a, a, that's a good analogy i like that it's pretty funny um but uh yeah you know like like you said i mean she she brings a lot of a lot of great experience um from one of the best uh one one of the best schools in the nation uh especially for athletics and you know she'll i you know i think honestly i think she'll do she'll do a lot of great things here at cmu and um you know kind of just kind of uh take how do I want to put it? it she's she's gonna she's gonna take what Alford did in his 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 three years here mm-hmm. and just continue to expand upon it. Um, she's just gonna expand upon that growth. Uh, so really excited to see what she's able to do. Um, like I said, she takes over uh, October fifth, Monday. So well, I guess this gets posted to on Monday. So today she's taking over. Um, the other big piece of news, Christian. Um, that we get, I'm really excited to talk about is Mac football is going to come back this fall. It will look different. It, it will look weird, but it's going to be football. Six game schedule starting the week of November 4th. They, they throw that November 4th like date on there. I don't think they'll play all six games on one night. That just seems like bad for TV. Um, so we'll, we'll go with the week of November 4th. Um, schedule has yet to be released. We're anticipating that it'll be released soon. Um, you know, 
like I said, so we're recording this on Sunday, which is October, October 4th. We're, closing, we're literally a month away from the start of the season. So that's, that schedule should be out relatively soon. Um, Christian, just, I guess, when you heard that the presidents were, were meeting after the Big Ten's decision to reinstate the football season, um, I guess, of course, hearing the MAC presidents were going to meet and that there was a decision looming, did you kind of have a feeling that they were going to go through with it and go try to try to play a season? Yeah, I did. I knew that when the, the Big Ten flipped the switch and then you started to hear the rumblings about the, the Pac-12 and the Mountain West, you know, flipping the switch on their decision as well. I, I knew that the Mid-American Conference was going to try and salvage something, um, especially with the fact that, you know, I think a lot of the decision in the first place to move it to the spring was that they were going to kind of be the trend center and move, you know, other conferences were going to follow suit. And initially they did, but then the big 10 turned and turned it around. And um, then I think there became a point where it was like, okay, we can't be the only conference not playing this fall. We're, we can't be the only conference that's, that's out there in the spring. Now it would be wonderful for TV money because you know, ESPN would, would go after that and, They'd have, you know, midweek match and all throughout uh, January, February, March, April, and maybe even May, depending on how the schedule worked out. But, you know, it's one of those things where you got to get the guys out there in the fall. You got to, you got to be on a level playing with everybody playing field everywhere else. If it was just a group of five um, that was, you know, going to play in the spring, I think they could do it and have the power five play in the fall. But since literally every other division one FBS conference is playing in the fall, I don't really think the Mid-American Conference had a decision to make on that front. However, there was the issue of testing and keeping all these student-athletes healthy, which is the big thing. And I think that's kind of where the snag was. And it seems like they've got a plan, you know, to work this out and play the whole season. So we'll see how well it goes. But I think there's a lot of optimism surrounding the season, especially on a campus like Central Michigan where, you know, you look at the numbers and the first couple of weeks – where the cases were really, really high, you know, the university had a big spike there, but now things are coming down. So it seems as if one of the universe, at least one of the universities within the MAC have gotten it under control. And another thing is CMU hasn't had to pause their workouts at all, uh, which is another positive sign. So things are trending in the right direction. Is it sustainable? Hopefully. Um, but I guess only time will be able to answer that question. Yeah, no doubt. Um, You know, we've seen a couple of different um, programs throughout the MAC having to cancel, shut down workouts. Uh, Buffalo most recently had had a spike of I think nineteen football players. Um, What last week? Literally just the week after the MAC announced that it would be coming back, Uh, Western Michigan also had to shut down its its workouts um, with some positive COVID cases a little, little spike down there in Kalamazoo um but the the one what was it the the testing part of it because I mean yeah when when well I think it was Thursday Thursday night when I heard that the Pac-12 and the Mountain West also flipped decisions that they were going to go that they were going to go through and play the season uh, and then hearing that the, the MAC presidents were going to meet that next day I knew the season was going to they were going to announce it um, cause you're right there. There's no way that they were going to say, Oh yeah, no, we're not, we're not going to play. We're going to be the only conference not to play. That seemed a little foolish, I think for, for recruiting going forward, but yeah, you're right. There would have been a, a pretty stellar TV deal with ESPN. So, I mean, it was kind of like a, it's almost like a double edged sword. Like do we play in the fall, play six games, lose out on, on some, lose out on some cash or, uh, play in the spring, lose out on some of the recruiting opportunity, but then you, you could actually increase that recruiting opportunity with saying, hey, look, we're on national TV. This is what we're doing. This is what our program's all about. You get all that exposure from ESPN. Have a huge TV deal. It, it, it works both ways, honestly. Um, but the you, – and you're absolutely right. The, the, testing th- the testing part of it, that was the one thing that – really was kind of holding everybody back, uh, I, I, I guess. Um, 
so they're going to test athletes four times a week and any positive test will require like a confirmation from a, I'm, I'm going to get this wrong, but a polymerase, polymerase chain reaction. It's a PCR test. Um, basically it just double checks everything that, yeah. Okay. This person has, has the, the virus that we're, I guess, claiming that they tested positive for. Um, and then following that confirmation, they would go straight into a cardiac screening protocol. Uh, a lot of athletes that had tested positive that kind of showed some symptoms and whatnot um, had experienced some, some cardiac problems. So um, the Mac really stepping up to make sure that, that players' hearts and, and, and um, circulatory systems are, are, are good mm-hmm. to go. Um, so, yeah, with that said, I mean, Christian, how, uh, how excited are you personally for, uh, for football to come back? Well, I think it's exciting for number one because it's going to provide a little bit more normalcy to the, to the everyday life that I live, you know. Last year, as a freshman in college, I kind of got into a rhythm of, you know, going to class and then coming and going to media availability or, you know, going to games and on weekends and not having that kind of threw me for a loop a little bit. And I was kind of forced to maybe spend a little bit more time on school and that sort of thing, which isn't a bad thing. But, you know, not having that rhythm, not having that set routine that, you know, I became accustomed to last year. It, it makes things tough, and so to have that back is nice on a personal level. And then obviously, you know, as a person who enjoys the game of football, it's exciting. It's exciting. It, you know, and we do this for a job, so, you know, it's like getting your job back. It's exciting, and I'm I'm stoked. I know that a lot of people within Mount Pleasant are stoked, even if they're not going to be able to, to go to Kelly Shorts on the weekends or I guess on the weekdays for at least the month of November. But I think this is a good news for Central Michigan because – you got a heck of a team coming back here. There's some holes to fill, definitely, but especially at the skill positions, you've got a good squad coming back. And right now, I think expectations are rightfully high, and we can get into that in a little bit. But there's a lot of optimism surrounding this program. And so I think Central Michigan, of all the schools, should be arguably the most excited that we're going to play in the fall. Yeah, and, and like you said, no no fans allowed uh, in, in Kelly Shorts or any of the MAC stadiums this year. But There'll, there'll still be that opportunity to see see your teams play, uh, to see your Chippewas play um, on on ESPN through some streaming services. Again, that'll all get announced and, and laid out once once the schedule comes out. Uh, but yeah, I mean it's it's exciting for sure. I mean, for me personally, like you said, I mean it's part of our job and and it's one of the more exciting parts of our job. And I'm I'm really looking forward to um, getting to kind of you're getting to document history like like we kind of did down in Cleveland uh, for the Mac, Mac Mac basketball tournament when when this whole thing really first started. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm really excited about that. And then um, yeah, like you said, I mean, there's just there should be a lot of optimism surrounding the team this year with a lot of the skill guys coming back. You know, and we'll jump right into that. But there's a lot of reasons to be excited about this CMU team in 2020. People always tell me "Eh, they're not going to be very good. What are you basing that on? I mean, they went what eight and six last year, eight and four in the regular season, six and two in the MAC. You tell me that's not pretty. That's not very good. Y'all are wrong. (laughs) Honestly, (laughs) going going from what they had in 2018. A dumpster fire, right? One eleven didn't win a single conference game, barely got by FCS Maine, right? Yes, sure. Some of those games were competitive. We won't talk too much about that. But to go from that in 2018 to what they did last year in 2019, <laughs> that's pretty. That's pretty damn good. And mm-hmm. a lot of those same guys are coming back, like you said. So with that said, Christian, who are some of the guys that you're you're looking to for, you know, to lead the way this year? Well, um, and I guess there's a little bit of uncertainty, you know, 
Coach McElwain was a little uh, a little vague in his first media availability about the status of David Moore. And I don't really buy that too much. I think that his suspension's up here in a couple of days. You know, it's been a year, and it was a year-long suspension. It wasn't a fixed amount of games. It was just a year-long suspension. And so, you know, without any further ado, I guess, it's not very often where you see an eight-win group of five team upgrade at quarterback, but I think that's what's going to happen for Central Michigan this year. I think that Quentin Dormady did his job, you know, as a game manager. Didn't have a great arm, but he put the ball in the hands of his skill guys. And I think with David Moore, you're getting a dude with a better arm, better mobility. And just, I mean, he in the four games he started, he showed flashes of being a star. And, you know, you go back, you know, all – Throughout this this coronavirus break, David Moore has been working with one of the better co- quarterback coaches in the uh, you know in the game of football. Quincy Avery, he's training a lot of the guys that you see on Sundays, guys like Deshaun Watson, and even you know Justin Fields, who's going to play on Sundays here in about eight months, maybe in a Lions uniform. So um, just to to see David Moore get out there, I think is going to be pretty exciting. You know the uh, connection he was able to build with Khalil Pimpleton. I'm super excited to see that just because those two got into a good rhythm with each other in the Akron game and then the Miami game, even though they didn't win it, they, you know, Khalil double digit catches. So I think that connection is going to be interesting to watch. And then on the defensive side of it, it's all about Troy Brown. Like he evolved into an anchor on that defensive side of the ball last year. So to see the development that he made over the course of the off season, I think is going to be really exciting. And also I'm, One of the more interesting things to me is how underrated Central Michigan's defensive line was last year. They were really good at stopping the run up until late in the year, and that's all to the credit of guys like Troy Hairston and and Robbie Stewart. And also one guy who kind of came along to the squad late in the year was Mo Diallo. And I think that Mo Diallo is going to take a big step forward with Texas A&M, first-team All-Mac or second-team All-Mac because, you know, he's a big body. And a whole year in Rob Akey's system, I think, is going to do him wonders, and he's going to get the chance to shine up front right away. So Mo Diallo defensively, I think, and then David Moore offensively are my two guys to watch. Yeah, no, that's that's totally understandable. And, and yeah, he McElwain was a, a little vague about about David Moore's return. Um he said something something about some some questions to the NCAA once that suspension is technically over. Um, so we'll 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 keep digging and try to find out more information on that because if David Moore isn't able to play, he isn't able to start. Because let's face it, I mean, if he's able to play, he's he's the the day one starter. Mm-hmm. If if Moore isn't able to go. Are you looking to Daniel Richardson, who played in a couple of games last year? Um, I mean, and and let's face it, there. I mean, he he played in garbage time. He didn't. He didn't. I think he threw one pass, um, and ran the ball a little bit. But he, it, I mean, he was ma- mainly just handing the ball off to, you know, uh, Kobe Lewis or Jonathan Ward. Are you looking? Are you, are you going to look to Daniel Richardson? Or are you going to look to the graduate transfer from Sam Houston State, Ty Brock? I think you go with Ty Brock, and I think that the reason you do that is to provide a little bit of a safety net for Daniel Richardson to the point where you don't need to go out there and throw him in the fire day one this season. So if David Moore is not able to go, you go Brock because, like, Richardson, obviously we know about his talent. We know about the things he can do on the football field, but adjusting to the college game isn't super easy. And, you know, you kind of saw that when he got in you know, for that fourth quarter against San Diego State, and there's guys in his face, and you got to kind of run around a little bit. So if you could kind of spare him from having to go head first into the fire early on, and then if he starts making plays in practice, you know, then maybe you roll with him. But I think that Ty Brock, he's got a lot of good in-game experience. This kid was a three-star recruit and had an offer from the University of Texas before he broke his leg. So there's talent to be had here. It's just a matter of staying healthy with Ty Brock. And I think that he not only brings in-game experience, but a good level of leadership that I think would, would blend him in with, let's face it, a group that's pretty experience heavy. You know, you've got a lot of upperclassmen at the skill positions. You know, the, the offensive line's a little bit younger with like Danny Matowski, Deontay Powell Woods, but those are guys that played in all 14 games last season. So 
plenty of experience all around. And I think that if you throw Brock in there, he's got it to the point where, you know, he can not only lead the team, but also make plays as well. He's a pretty good runner and a decent thrower. So I think this was a good get for the Chippewas. And I also think that if he's able to live up to his potential, should more not be able to go, this may be one of the bigger steals in all of college football because, you know, Ty Brock, the talent that he brings, throw that in with all the skill guys coming back. And this offense has to be, has a chance to be lethal regardless of who's leading him behind center. Yeah. And it, it's definitely going to be exciting. Um, that I think that passing game, and if, if whether it's Moore or, or Brock, I mean that yeah. passing game is going to be really exciting. Um, oh yeah, like you said with, with Khalil Pimpleton, Jacory Sullivan, Tyrone Scott coming back. Still a couple of questions at tight end. Uh, obviously Tony Polgen transferring out, moving his himself over to Virginia. Um, there are still some questions at who's actually going to start at tight end because Bernard Raymond moving over to offensive tackle. Um, so I mean, I mean. That Poljan was a, a pretty big part of the offense last year. Cause, I yes. mean, he was obviously a huge dude. You'd throw it anywhere within like a three foot radius of him, and he's going to catch it. Um, but with with Raymond moving over, and he has kind of a similar playing style to what Poljan has. I mean, who 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 are we looking at at tight end? Do you think um, who are who are some of? I know Austin Herget is is one of the guys. Um, that's they're going to rely on a little bit at tight end, but might there be somebody else as well from what you well, well, kind of guess? Yeah. One of the guys I was really looking forward to seeing from the class of 2020 was Davis Hines and who was, you know, he's a huge tight end from Wisconsin, but he's one of the 14 guys not coming until January. And so he's not going to be there. I thought he may be able to step in and play from day one had he came this fall, but, with that not being the case, you're down to three guys. You're down to uh, Joe Wilson. Joe Wilson, a guy who it was injured in the season over against Albany and didn't come back until the MAC title game. So, you know, not really much out there on him. You mentioned Hergen. He's a converted quarterback. So there's uh, some athleticism there. It's just a matter of, you know, Hergen's a big dude too. Like size-wise, he's built pretty well. He's He's a good fit for the position. It's just a matter of can he get out there, can he – make the plays. He's probably not going to be the kind of the game breaker that Tony Poljan was, but if he can, you know, provide time, CMU love to go with those two tight end sets, especially early in games. And then, um, you know, later in games when you need to run the football and get first downs, they love the two tight end packages with Poljan and Raymond. So it's really interesting that, you know, they slide him over to tackle. However, maybe, maybe now you see a little bit of shift in that. And instead of going two tight ends, maybe you bring out, Raymond is an extra offensive tackle and, um, you know, kind of go unbalanced with, you know, you kind of overload the offensive line in certain run heavy situations. So a lot of different things you can do with that. And then the third guy is Michael Hegewald, who's a transfer from Dayton, really no update on his status. I know he's a junior, so not sure how much he'll be able to play or even if he will be able to play. I know the uh, NCAA transfer waivers, especially at the group of five level are just really weird and, you know, it takes forever to find out whether you can or cannot play. So that'll be interesting to see how they handle that. And maybe you got to kind of get creative at tight end. And maybe you slide Hunter Butchkowski or Oakley Lavalli, both of those guys. Well, they were listed as fullbacks on the roster, but in the spread formation, a fullback and a tight end are pretty much um, interchangeable. So a lot of different things you could do, but not a whole lot of bodies to choose from. So that's another interesting wrinkle, I think, that you'll have to take a watch for for uh, for Charlie Fry and how he's able to kind of work out the kinks at that position. And another position that they're really light at is running back. Um, just three guys on roster, one of them being a walk-on freshman, John Shelton from East Grand Rapids, who's actually on a wrestling scholarship. So, again, not a ton of depth there. So that's just the, the, the way it's going to be with the COVID season and guys not coming and guys opting out. Josh Crawford opting out, I mean, never played a snap last year, but I'd argue it's the biggest loss just because of the depth that he could have provided. So maybe Coom Gawilly gets some carries. Uh, I know he just shifted over to linebacker, so that'd be kind of funny if he kind of go back to playing running back. Yeah, I hope they didn't miss him in the running back room. But, yeah, just a lot of different wrinkles and changes that are going to have to come about because of this season. 
Yeah, and like you said, um, four opt-outs. Uh, we'll kind of ch- jump ship here. A uh, couple of guys opting out uh, with Deron Irving Bay, Jaquez Bristol, uh, Trey Jones, and Josh Crawford, like Christian said, all opting out. And then, what was it, 14 freshmen are uh, gray-shirting, so they're still – going to be able to take classes and, and, and take care of that business, just not play this season. Uh, and then they'll join the team in January for, well, what we anticipate will be a spring practice, but we're not obviously not sure about that going yeah. forward. But, um, you know, and I mean, we are, we you already touched on that, that Crawford's probably one of the biggest losses um, out of those four, but um, you know, as the season goes along, I mean, do you think like do you? I'm not sure if they're going to be able to play all six games, because you know if if some a lot of guys test positive, they might have to shut down a game. They might not be able to reschedule games. Because I mean, the it's it's a really quick sprint. It's kind of like what the MLB did uh, with its with its shortened season. That it's it's sixty games, right? But six games in such a such a short amount of time it really doesn't allow for many postponements or really any postponements I think they're going to be able to pull it off I mean the numbers have been pretty have been pretty low here at CMU but then you like like we kind of talked about before there's some places that are still experiencing some spikes Mm -hmm. in positive cases as the days go along so I don't I don't know if I mean, I don't think that they, but I mean, so say Western Michigan has a huge spike, but CMU is totally fine. They still can't go out and play right. because, you know, they might not, Western Michigan might not have enough guys to go out and, and compete and do so safely. So do you, th- so are, are you like, what, what are you kind of thinking about the season? Are you, are you kind of in the same boat? Like, uh, might not actually be completely doable or are you, are you kind of like what? What are your What are your thoughts, honestly? I'm skeptical. I think it can happen. I think that the the one thing that is going to probably hurt squads a little bit is the the contact tracing thing, and you know you've seen that at um, at various levels, and especially since this season started. I know that Arkansas State's had to miss a couple of games, and their beat reporter George Stoya wrote a pretty good story just about contact tracing and what it is. And essentially what it boils down to is if one guy in a position group tests positive, then the rest of the guys be locked up, essentially in quarantining. And, and it's, it's difficult. And, you know, Jim McElwain mentioned in his first presser that they've been kind of working guys on both sides of the ball so that if something like that does happen, you've got bodies to roll with and, you know, say – a linebacker test positive, and then you're suddenly potentially down all your linebackers. And um, now you've got to go with two guys playing both ways. I know usually you double maybe a running back or a tight end over there. So maybe you see like a guy like Hunter Bruchkowski playing linebacker on a Wednesday or a Saturday or wherever Central is going to play. So that whole dilemma of contact tracing and keeping guys healthy – really adds, you know, a whole level of depth to this season. And do I think six games is doable? Absolutely. Um, is it feasible? I don't know. It's just this whole coronavirus thing has been so unpredictable. And just when you think it's starting to go away, it comes back. And so there's just going to be a lot of ebbs and flows. And we're all going to be tested on how well we can adapt and our flexibility and all that sort of thing. So, I mean, buckle up, man. We've got to – interesting couple months ahead of us yeah i know I'm, I'm, i mean obviously i'm really looking forward to it but i mean we've we've mm-hmm. seen some problems in the nfl with some guys testing positive having the nfl having to move some games around i mean they're talking one to two days difference but they're still having to move some games around um so i'm just yeah i, I think skeptical is the right word there i'm just really anxious to see how they're going to try to pull this off. I mean, I think they can. Um, I, like I said, I think they can, but I'm like you said, I'm, I'm, I'm very skeptical about it. Um, 
just it just seems like that it's it's so, I mean, in, in the MLB, I mean, not not all the teams played 60 games, right? A, lot, a couple of the teams ended up playing like 57 or 58 games. I think the, the Cardinals ended up playing only, I think, 57 games, which obviously is just three short, but those three games could have given the Cardinals the division title or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I'm, I, I, am, I am really excited to see um, – how the season is laid out um, five, obviously you're going to see is going to play the five division games and then one cross division game. So one team in the Mac East, uh, not obviously we don't know who it is, who it is yet. Uh, we, we obviously know the five divisional opponents, but we don't know who that one um, cross divisional game is. Um, but from what if from what I understand, and if if they keep the schedule, uh, I guess if they keep the series as they, I guess are supposed to be played out. I think is the right way to say that. Um, CMU would have two divisional games at home, and then one the one cross divisional game would be at home. So that so then they would play three divisional games on the road. I think mm-hmm. Eastern Michigan, Northern Illinois, and Toledo. So that means they would get. Western Michigan and Ball State at home, and then that one Mac East team. Um, so, in terms of the actual football piece of it, I'm really excited to see what's going to happen. I mean, man, it's oh, yeah. it's it's going to be it's going to be exciting, and I'm really really anxious to see who that that one cross division game is. Um, you know, if it, if it's Miami of Ohio, a, a rematch of last year's Mac championship game. I mean, you play that, you know last week in November, first week of December. That, that, would be actually, that would be actually pretty ironic if they played a regular season game that first weekend in December like they that did. That would be. That would be, <laughs> that would be hysterical. Um, oh, yeah. But, and you're right, that would be, that would be electric. Obviously, the, no fans to make a difference, but um, I'm still really excited. One, one random, very random thing. Do you think we're going to get to see the marching chips this year? Or are they what what some of the some of the um it, when we're not obviously we're not a political show but some of the um executive orders that were put in place I I guess have have been technically nullified. I'm not sure uh, please don't please don't come from my head, but I I, I just <laughs> I'm not I'm not exactly sure how all that's going to work out. Um but with that said, I mean you know, it, the uh, the Mac release said that spirit teams and bands and stuff like that are gonna, you know, would be able to participate based on the school's discretion. So, with CMU having such low cases in here in Isabella County and Mount Pleasant, do you think we're gonna get to see the marching chips? Honestly, I. I mean, there's definitely potential. I think at the very least you'll hear them. You know, there's plenty of space around Kelly Shorts to maybe if they're not playing uh, on the field, maybe they they put something together maybe at halftime or something like that, you know, or maybe just on the – maybe they pre-record a performance and they throw it up on the the billboard at halftime or something like that. I think they'll get creative. I think if halftimes are about the marching band and lining up and putting together super cool designs on the field and – Without that, what? Well, I mean, what? What is there to do? You're gonna throw over reruns of Tom and Jerry on the on the scoreboard for the the beat writers delight because that's who's gonna be there. Honestly, you're gonna get the the beat writers and the communications people. I mean, they, maybe they just pull us and they ask us, you know, is it gonna be Family Guy is today? Is it gonna be King of the Hill? Because uh, I really don't know what halftime is gonna look like, and that's, gosh, that's one of the things that I'm gonna be kind of excited to experience um, really just what's that going to look like. And then I know that we, when we went down to Cleveland, they didn't pipe in the crowd noise, which was, I mean, crowd noise is like a who's back of the week because everybody loves the crowd noise that they pipe in there. And Sometimes it gets weird because the, the, the noise guy doesn't know who's the home team. And so they're cheering when the away team scores a touchdown 
just the whole like the Python crowd noise. It's going to be a super different environment this year, and I'm ex- excuse me, I'm excited to see how it goes. He said they're going to throw Tom and Jerry up on the <laughs> oh my well I mean, what, they might. I'm go let's go back to that for just a hot second. You already know my vote is family guy. You know that. Um yeah, me too. Unanimous. <laughs> hell yeah. It's unanimous from the CM Life guys that, that we want family guy up on that board. Absolutely. But uh but yeah, I mean it's it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting. It's gonna be Yeah, and and God that 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 game in Cleveland was just eerie. Um, you know, some people asked me to like, hey, take video. Like, told them take video of this thing. Like, you, you're going to want it. And yeah, I was actually just scrolling back through um, some photos and videos and Twitter and stuff, and I came across it, and I just was just floored. First of all, that that was in March. That was six months, or I guess now seven months ago. And mm-hmm. here we are we're getting ready to have a football season, but, uh, yeah, that was just absurd, but I'm, I, I am, I am really excited. You know, I, um, I mean the, the, the marching chips are out there practicing. I know it's, you know, part of the, part of the, uh, mm-hmm. coursework, but they're still out there practicing. I mean, the drum line had a performance, what, a couple of weeks ago. Um, yep. And that's, it, it's always, it's always good to hear, here's, hear the drum line here. Um, you know some of the other um, other uh, groups doing their thing, play, playing their music, and hearing that when you're walking around campus. Um, at first, it was very disheartening. Cause I'm like, man, you're you're killing me. The, this great this great college football traditional music, and there's no college football to be played here. Um, but then after the announcement that they were going to play, man, I get the blood pumping. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. All right. Last thing. I want to talk expectations, predictions, what have you. How do you think CMU is going to do this year? Final record, uh, you know, record, uh, you know, because we already talked about guys, you know, stepping in. Yeah. But give me a final record. Give me a prediction, you know, where they're going to finish in the division, maybe conference championship. Uh, if there's a bowl game, maybe give, throw out a prediction for a bowl game. I mean, I know the um, the Bahamas Bowl and the Hawaii Bowl both shut down, canceled for this year uh, due to the travel restrictions. But other than that, it sounds like all the bowl games are a go. Every team is bowl eligible, apparently. So good luck with that with 130 teams, um, you know, <laughs> trying to vie for – this this is going to prove that we have too many bowl games, right? No, I'm I'm just kidding. Um, but anyway, outside of the two that I listed, sounds like all the bowl games are still going to be on. We'll see what happens when it actually comes bowl season. So enough rambling from me. Predictions, record, all of it. What do you got? Well, you know, anytime you bring back as much firepower as they are, and you bring back a coach. Like Jim McElwain, I mean, say what you want about the guy, but the dude took the 1-11 program and flipped it on its head. He brought in discipline, the, the players bought in, and he took them to the back title game. And so I think the expectations should be high for this football team. I think that you got to get four wins, five wins, and it's out there that you could go 6-0, and honestly. Like, that's not out of the realm of possibility for this squad, and it shouldn't be. Because, the, you know, when you come in as a first-year head coach, and you improve your program by seven wins in year one, the expectation goes from here to here. And now you've set that bar for yourself, and anything less than four wins, I would say, is a disappointment. I think 500 is is a disappointment this year for Central Michigan, and I think that the players get that, and they understand that. And this is a motivated group because they – they, you know, they did what they did, and they won the Mag West, but they didn't finish the job last year. And so I think that there's a fire burning in that locker room. And now the uh, the schedule, you know, you mentioned that Toledo on the road, Northern Illinois on the road. I certainly think they're better than Northern Illinois, but that Toledo on the road, I think 
you know, if you want to play those guys, you want to play them early because, yeah, I mean, say what you want about last year. I think that a lot of last year's game was just that Central Michigan wanted that game more than Toledo did. Um, we know a chance to go to the Mac West championship game. There really wasn't a whole lot at stake for Toledo in that ball game. So just the uh, the motivation that's going to come with this squad, I think. And it's going to come down to that game against Toledo because I think that they knock off Western Michigan at home. I think they handle Ball State as well. And then, obviously, depending on that draw, I don't know if they beat Miami of Ohio. Obviously, getting them at home helps if that's the squad they get. But if, you know, honestly, that decision process is going to be interesting for the MAC because how do you go about that game, that, that crossover game? Do you just draw it out of a hat? Or do you go maybe the, the number one from the MAC West plays the number six from the MAC East and you kind of stagger it that way? Or do you go one versus one? Or the third, um, the third alternative, I'm, in my opinion, was we just go geographic and um, the the closest squad to each of the the crossover teams. You just try to keep the teams together and close. So, you know, if that's the case, Central's going to get Akron or they're going to get Bowling Green, uh, and I think they're better than both of those teams certainly. So, I guess between five and anywhere between four and two and six and zero. Oh, I think it all depends. Obviously, football is a crazy game and weird things happen. So, I mean, kind of making predictions, especially in a year like this is, you know, but honestly, the, the ex- my expectations for this team are high. As, as That's what happens when you, when you have a turnaround like they did a year ago. And, you know, Jim McElwain's caught a lot of golf about maybe not winning the big games when he needs to. I mean, last year, MAC championship game in the New Mexico were both – tough performances so I think if there's a year he's going to turn this thing around it's got to be this one and maybe this is the year for CMU so I would say five and one as my my uh, realistic expectation with that lone loss being on the road at Toledo unbelievable that was literally going to be my same thing no um but yeah you're right I mean yeah the expectations are high you got high expectations. I do too. Like that's what happens when you turn the program around, like McElwain did in year one. Yeah, and and, and you're absolutely right. I mean, McElwain, reigning Mac Coach of the Year, and like you said, I mean, he just improved so many things about the program from 2018 to 2019. Um, that that improvement and that, like you said, expectations just continues to rise. It's just going to keep going up and up and up. Um, and some of the games that come to mind that CMU struggled in and ultimately lost that Western Michigan game that argue, I mean, CMU moved the ball well in between the twenties and then they get in the red zone and, and just couldn't do anything. Yeah. Um, that that's one game that comes to mind, but, um, and then, you know, they struggled at, a little bit against Bowling Green on the road. So the road games, I think, are especially because they're all divisional games, I think it's going to be a little bit more of a struggle than than you and I are thinking. But at the end of the day, on paper, I mean, I, I would argue that CMU is better than at least two of those of those teams in eastern Michigan and northern Illinois. Toledo mm-hmm. is such a toss-up, and you're, you're right. If you, if you get Toledo early in, in, the, in the slate, then I think – CMU has a really good shot to to beat Toledo on the road, but that's that's the one game that I'm really keeping my eye on. And again, that's just based on on how the series has played out. It yeah, just, you know, the Mac could just say, "Hey, screw it, we're just gonna we're gonna change everything." Um, mm-hmm. I would I would think they try to keep the integrity of that series as as much yeah. as, as they could. Um, I think they'll do it for all of them. Yeah, I you know all five divisional games. I mean, they play every year, so to try to keep that series. Um, going and then who you know the whatever um but yeah the 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 one game that that I'm really keeping my eye on again potentially is that is that is that game at Toledo that's the one that if if they're if they're going to lose a game that's going to be the one um mm-hmm. cuz i mean western western michigan i think is is pretty young and i i, I think they're going to struggle a little bit um yeah. this year um ball state i mean ball state was a was a decent team last year, um, but I don't I don't think they'll find much success again this year. So it, chalk up the two divisional home wins. Um, Eastern Michigan was just not 
quite as good as, as they had expected last year. I think that continues again this year. Uh, Northern Illinois, again, that's a toss-up. I mean, even in that 1-11 season, CMU had a chance to beat Northern Illinois on the road. So that, you know, I, I could chalk that one up as a win too. But then, and then whoever comes out of the East, it'll be at home and CMU plays really well at home under McIlwain. I think all of McIlwain's yes. teams play really well at home. Um, no matter where he was, <laughs> you know, Colorado State, be it Florida, be it now at Central Michigan, um, those teams play really well at home. So you can chalk up the three home wins. And then the the one game that Chippewa fans need to circle, and obviously you already talked about it, and I'm going to talk about it again, is that Toledo game. Yes. Um, if, if you're, if you're going to – you know, throw a party and cheer on your Chippewas for one game. Let it be that one, and the Western game, of course. Um, but that's the, that's the one that they're uh, that the Chippewas might struggle in. Do they win it? Maybe. I think they might. They have a good shot at it. But ultimately, I think they go five and one, just like literally in agreement with you. Which might sound lame, but it's that's the truth. It's my expectation. But yeah, I mean. You know, you mentioned Western being a little bit young. Anytime you lose your starting quarterback and your starting running back in the same year, especially with how pivotal Wasink and Bellamy were in that offense, I think that that's going to take a little bit of an adjustment period. Now, if Central gets them late in the year and they get hot, maybe that's a tough one. But especially, that's another squad you want to get them early. I Personally, I think it would be sweet if Central played Western week one. I mean, throw all the rivalries out there and then maybe – you know, the one thing about the MAC teams that I've kind of noticed over the years is that the good ones get hot late. You know, Central did that last year with a comeback win over Ball State and then the pounding of Toledo. And then, you know, the year before it was Buffalo who got hot late. So I think the best MAC teams play their best ball at the end of the year. And so you want a, to be a team that peaks, you know, late in the season. And if you, you slip up early on, and that's another reason why you want to get Toledo early is if you do – slip up early on you've got the rest of the year to to put the pressure on Toledo and make them keep winning so yeah I mean it would be beneficial to get those squads over but at the same time you got to play those games one game at a time and I mean there's not a whole lot of, con uh, of control you can have over the situation and for that reason you just got to roll the punches the one thing I am bummed about though there being no fans and especially with the season getting pushed back was you know this year the month of November was it originally for Central Michigan going to be four primetime national televised games. You know, that whole month of November was going to be on ESPN. And I just think that would have been a really cool experience. You know, I don't know what traveling is going to look like for us reporters, but to go into the Glass Bowl um, on, a, on a, I think it was a Tuesday night was when they were supposed to play Toledo. Just experience that. You know, I think that would have been really cool. And to go to Northern Illinois, you know, on a weekend on a college football Saturday and into Calb, Illinois would have been sweet. So it's going to be a bummer not getting to travel to those games. But the fact that there's football either way is good enough for me. Yeah, you said it. You're absolutely right. And obviously, you know, our, our coverage team, I mean, you're pretty much looking at – you're looking at the coverage team right now for this year for CM Life. So um, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll keep you guys updated. We'll, we'll let you know if uh, – we're going to be able to travel to some of the games or the, the three road games. Um, you know, one, one of which is in state. So we might should be able to, I mean, I've seen, I've seen plenty of reporters throughout the country. So even college reporters uh, go out and travel to um, a bunch of games. I mean, some of the guys from the Oklahoma daily traveled to uh, Iowa state. Well, actually I think it was just one guy, one guy, uh, their, their sports editor traveled to Iowa state uh, on Saturday to go you know, see that to go, cover and report that game see right there in, in Ames, Iowa. So we'll see what happens. Um, so, you know, sounds like it should be a, another great year for central Michigan life football coverage. Um, and another good year for, for CMU football as well. Um, Christian, any, any final thoughts as we, uh, as we wrap this thing up? No, nah, man, I'm just excited to get back rolling. All right, man. Me too. <laughs> I, you know, I definitely, uh, definitely need this. I'm really excited about it, and excited to kind of get this, get back into the flow of of, an, of a sports season. We'll obviously keep tabs on on the basketball season as well going forward. But um, 
otherwise than that, guys, thank you so much for tuning in, for, for listening, and for, for watching if you're watching here on YouTube. Um, make sure you follow along with us, Christian and I, on, on Twitter, um, at, at CM Life Sports on Twitter. We're, like I said, we're both pretty easy to find uh, on CM Life Sports. Obviously, follow us at CM Life on Twitter, Central Michigan Life on Facebook. And stay tuned with all of our coverage at cm-life.com for again all of your great all of your great Chippewa coverage, as well as all the news around the university. One more time, thank you guys so much for tuning in, and we will talk to you next week when we meet again. <laughs>